Welcome to Tokyo State of Mind Season 2, a podcast that is rebellious and full of passion, talks about life in Japan. On this podcast, we share inspirational stories, hacks, and tips, as well as adventurous spirits to make you feel good about yourself and life in Japan. We value authenticity, meaningful connections, and collaborations, as well as passionate souls that we always invite to our podcast. And today's guest, um, is a world filmmaker, um, originally from Canada and France, who has been traveling for more than 15 years old, capturing the stories of people through his works, working on different projects um, and brands like Dior and Puma and Hypebeast. Um, and I'm very happy to introduce you to Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. My pleasure. Can you tell... Um, your story. How did you, um, how did you end up being in Japan and like all these different countries and doing your work? Oh, uh, that's a long story. I came in Japan first at 17 years old uh, after finishing a game named Final Fantasy VII. I thought that only crazy people uh, could do such a game, so I had to visit them to know how crazy they are. So I moved to a Japanese family for two months uh, in a small village, small city, small town next to Nagoya. So I lived with them a whole summer at 17. Learned Japanese then, uh, then was obsessed by Japan until 20. I went to a film school, uh, Concordia, probably the best in Canada. I hated it. Uh, I'm a little bit against school in general, especially when it's about filmmaking. I think that you buy an iPhone and you go shoot and you watch a lot of movies. That's all you need. Uh, going to school with a lot of pretentious people, like way, way too artsy for me at the end of the day. So I, I left school and I said that. I'm not going to graduate if I don't go in exchange. So I went to Temple University uh, in Tokyo uh, at 21, 20 or 21. So I went one year. Then I studied here. I made a, I made a couple of movies. Uh, my my love for movie making really appeared when I was here, as I wasn't inspired at all at all back home. But when I landed in Japan, I realized that I wanted to shoot everything. So I shot a couple of projects uh, at 21, 20, 21. Then I felt that. I needed to get way better to come back in Japan and to really call uh, this place my home. So I moved to New York, Shanghai, Hong Kong, a couple of places around the world. And at 26 or 27, I came back for real in Japan on a working holiday visa that turned into an artist visa. And I've been on the artist visa for four years now, uh, making arts and movies in Japan. So it's a, it's so far like almost a, a 15 years old love story with uh, with Japan. Whoa, that's crazy. 15 years old. Yeah, yeah. I always story. knew. Since I like since, how you said it. Yeah, it's a big love story. Like I knew <laughs> from a young age that was the country for me, and uh, this feeling of I've, I've not disappeared uh, is the same. That was when I was fifteen. What makes Japan special for you? Uh, for you? Well, in this globalized world, everywhere you go, start to look the same. Like the little hipster area of even Istanbul can look a little bit like the hipster area of New York. That look like a little bit like the hipster area of uh, Paris and there is this globalization that is a good thing even though COVID showed us that it wasn't a good thing but this globalization makes each and every country similar and uh, after traveling for a while I realized that Japan doesn't have that. Japan kept such a strong identity that you constantly feel in a different world and you are, and you can learn a lot from it. Uh, so I feel that the Japan being so different uh, make it really, really attractive to me as I'm always confronted to new things and I need to completely adjust to this country. Um, and I feel that Japanese people in a way are the opposite of me as I'm really loud and, and I learn a lot from them and I think they can learn from me. So it's a constant learning process here. Constant exchange program. Exactly. It's infinite. I mean, you, I'll never be Japanese even if I'm a Japanese woman, I've got a Japanese kid. I will always be a stranger here. And in a way, I like it. I love uh, feeling different and it's, it allows me also as an artist to reinvent myself all the time and never get bored. So yeah, Japan so far uh, uh, is one of my favorite countries because it, it, it kept an identity that is uh, incredible, that is uh, so powerful uh, for the best and the worst. I mean, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. Uh, it's not all pink, but... What is the worst part for you? I mean... The, the system is really rigid. I'm I'm a filmmaker, which means that you like we, freedom. We love freedom. We love to be creative. Uh, we love to not do things following a pattern. 
And I do believe that the rigidity of Japanese society makes it really com complicated to be an artist here. But I've got the Gaijin card. <laughs> I can be different. And you can play. It. I can play. I can, I can use it when I need to. But as a young Japanese man or a young artist, you have to fit in a box and it must be tremendously hard. Right. Uh, but this rigidity also makes food or arts so good in Japan. Too. It's a double-edged sword. It's not perfect. Nowhere is perfect. Yeah. But sometimes this rigidity is uh, is killing me. That's why I usually travel out of Japan three to six months a year to refresh myself as I feel a bit trapped uh, after a while and I need to come back to live to re realize how much I love Japan. And it yeah. has been the same thing over and over for four years. <laughs> I'm getting crazy, losing my mind. Go do project outside and come back because I always miss it after a while. It's like a, yeah. a drug, addictive drug, you know. It's interesting how you mentioned that because I think before you there was another guest uh, who who is a model here and he he said the same thing. So mm. if, it's like if you stick around here for around a year, you start becoming Japanese a little bit and mm -hmm. it, and it it just gets to you. So you need a fresh air somewhere else. And he he said how he was also traveling to other countries to remind that there's diversity and there are other cultures and he doesn't have to follow the certain rules that are here and then yeah. he comes back. You have to see diversity. You have to see different colors. And I miss it tremendously. Thanks God, there is a little bit of diversity, but we're talking about 5% to 7% of immigrants in Japan. I'm coming from a city where we basically all are immigrants. <laughs> like like Paris or Montreal are both cities where like you come from the whole world. And this diversity is wonderful. Uh, so I need both. Uh, but you know, that's Japan will always follow me. And I still bow. In Montreal, when I come home, and I bow, and I say thank you, and uh, <laughs> I kept some. Um, yeah, even today, you 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 came to our studio, and you're like, "Hajime uh, <laughs> Immediate, no, but I mean, there is a respect here, and something so powerful and beautiful. That I want to bring outside. I want to bring gift to people. I want to be respectful. I want to bow. I want to show respect at the end of the day, and that's something that uh, I think the Western world could learn from Japan. Okay. <laughs> a lot. Right. So you have worked with a lot of um, local Japanese um, celebrities and a lot of like cool brands. And what what is it like to to work with them? I mean, I've I've done a couple of big campaigns, and I do deal with with uh, with I don't know if I call that celebrities. I mean, to me, they are the same, and my attitude won't change in front of the most famous Japanese person. I'm just going to be more respectful, but. I believe they're all human beings at the end of the day. Working in Japan, like I said, I've got the Gaijin card. I don't operate the same way as Japanese crew. Uh, so it has been interesting, but I mean, it's a, it's a case by case thing. Um, it's, I mean, I love documenting the life of people. And honestly, uh, with Japan, I need to double or triple the days of shooting before Japan is open up to me. Mm -hmm. For example, interview in Japan is after one hour or one and a half that people start opening. Mm -hmm. Before that, you have to do the icebreaker. It takes some time. Uh, it takes some time, and I, I love getting deep into the life of people. And I believe that a lot of content I'm doing nowadays, for commercial wise, is a bit superficial. It's always the same bullshit you watch. Oh yeah, I do that. I wake up like that. It's a little bit shallow, and I wish yes. I could have I could yeah. have the time to get way deeper into their life. And it takes time. Japanese don't open up that fast. And uh, and I'm ex but the thing is I I really love putting the camera so close from them, mm -hmm. getting um, noxious a little bit. But that's because I want to take the best out of them. And you know, you interview a Frenchman, you spend one day with a Frenchman, you don't want to be with him anymore. You've learned enough. <laughs> he spoke all day. You got crazy. Maybe got you know you can almost see the best and the worst in one day with, with a French person, Italian or highly emotional people. With Japanese, you have to take your time. Mm -hmm. You have to dig deeper. If you want to break the ice and see the, the iceberg, which is 70% of the person. What do you do to, to get there? Alcohol. Get them drunk. <laughs> uh, what else? Alcohol always help. Uh, no, other than that, I'm just being nice and let them do, 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 do their life. What if the person doesn't drink? No, I'm just kidding about alcohol. But sometimes it's n nice at night to lose them up a little bit. It depends depend on the person, really. But the best, the best is just spend a long time with them. Do not force anything. I wish to have the luxury in my project to spend a whole week with someone and things will unveil. But uh, in my job each day, uh, we have a proper budget. We can't, we, have, we can't stay too long with those people. So I just have to be really friendly and try to, to get the best out of them. But 
you can't force it. It's something that needs to come organically. I think that's a, the base of my work is work organic. Things need to come naturally. Mm -hmm. And they always do. Uh, and if they don't, it's okay. You can still capture the beauty of the person. And at the end of the day, when you, I love doing portraits of artists. And time to time, the art speak more than themselves. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't have to dig too deep about who he is. His art right. is a representation of himself. And maybe he's so good at making art because he's not able to express himself other ways, in other ways. So it's a case-by-case -case thing, uh, but it's always lovely. And it's amazing how Japanese people are respectful. And yeah, like you said, I, I shot some people and I work with big actors and they are so humble. They're so humble. It's, and they always accept to work with foreigners. We have like a big advantage because we propose different kind of story that they usually, the drama they do. And, and, and they, they are so nice. So it's humbling. Mm -hmm. Because you know, in the West, I mean, a lot of people have more pretension. It's tough to work with them, but here, I felt that people are just so nice, so so humble and so sweet. So I, I felt really good. I met recently uh, Rinko Kikuchi. Um, she played in Babel. She's probably one of the greatest Japanese actresses right now. And she was the nicest. I uh, lunch with her for a project. I couldn't believe how nice she was and. It's just special. I met also, also um, oh, heroes. I forgot his name. He plays the chef of Yakuza in uh, Kill Bill. Really big actor. And he was the sweetest man. Uh, so it's really incredible and humbling. Really humbling. Yeah, they are so nice. Wow. They are so sweet. Hey, did you see our subscribers? Oh, you are our subscriber. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe button, plus leave the comments so Tokyo State of Mind can create more great content for you. Enjoy your video! So, so far you, you've done so many like interesting projects, so I, I saw on your social media, mm. and um, you were also talking about like uh, how at some point you were tired of the commercial project and you wanted to do something more meaningful. Yeah. So can you tell more about it? Um, I mean, we see what's going on right now. Uh, with COVID, economic crisis, global warming. I mean, clearly the capitalistic model has failed. It's not going to work. We, we, had, we had like 2,000 years, 5,000 years to, to be capitalist and it failed. I mean, it clearly didn't work. So why on earth would I just work and try to sell product to people? Freaking shoes, deal, hair product. Why, why am I doing that? When the world's falling apart, my kids are going to live in a shitty world. Uh, and still, I'm going to try to make selfishly money selling products. So I, I believe that those, eth ethically speaking, the more I do those big commercial jobs, the more I, I, I feel unease uh, looking at the mirror. And I want to be an inspiration. You need to lead by example. You need, mm -hmm. if I want, my next movie I want to shoot in Chiang Mai in March, it's about, it's about global warming and how a guy, the whole world is burning and he's on his cell phone on Instagram. That's us. That's my generation. We are coward. We are coward. We know what's going on. We know everything's falling apart. And yet, we work for money. We work in one goal, is to be successful. What the fuck? Let's not be successful. Let's, let, why would we be successful? What's the point of being success, successful? If there's nothing to buy anymore, nothing to consume <laughs> anymore, if there's no more fucking food or water. No, no, but that's a serious question that no one asks. So yes, I want to take a distance from commercial job. I do need to pay my rent, but I also believe that commercial job can be meaningful. Um, you can turn uh, a product like those, those joggings, um, hair product or anything into something meaningful, into making portraits of people who do sustainable work, artists, inspiring stuff. So I don't mind doing commercial job anymore, but it has to be meaningful. It has to. And if I don't, I would not share it and I would be ashamed of it. It mm -hmm. will pay my rent. That was the point. You know, there is bigger thing than that. Last 15 years have shown me that I can make a living and I can... I can also make a lot of money in the commercial job world. I, I've, I've proved myself that, but that's okay. I don't have to. So slowly but surely, I'm moving to more documentary film, uh, documentary only movies about inspiring people. For example, I've just followed a 60 years old man across 48 US states during the pandemic, uh, riding 400 kilometers per day and breaking the world record. The guy did it because he wants to inspire people to do meaningful job in their life. Uh, I'm releasing the video in maybe two weeks. Uh, a short documentary about him and we're trying to raise money to make a long documentary about him. That was so inspiring. For me, the experience was inspiring and for people who are going to watch that, that's what I want to do. And if I can get paid to do it, that would be 
the ultimate dream. So yeah, going away from commercial job, it has, it, I have to, I mean, I got sick during commercial job, physically sick. I got two ulcers. Uh, I went to the hospital last year. They found I had uh, stomach cancer after shooting a, a big what? commercial job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I got physically sick. It was so stressful dealing with agency, dealing with clients. You have to imagine that big commercial, a director is just a tool. Mm-hmm. Big, it, the old model is you have a client, for example, let's say Adidas. It goes to an ad, advertising company, a creative agency. And then they go to me as a director. They already have a pitch and they already have a storyboard. I'm just a tool. And then they ask me, make a treatment. I do a beautiful treatment with my vision. They look at it and they say, no, we did it already for you. So you end up <laughs> being a tool and you, you pay to shut, to shut up, you know? Mm-hmm. And it made me sick. It made me physically sick. Stress uh, provoke uh, creation of acidity in the stomach and creating ulcers. So this whole thing made me physically sick. And so last year, I completely quitted commercial job and now I'm coming back to it. But I'm trying to make it more cultural and more, more interesting, like I did before, but even more. And cutting everything that is shallow, superficial, or influencer related. I believe influencers are the cancer of our generation. Mm-hmm. I despise influencers. Most of them, most of them are grabbing the attention of people for the wrong reason. You have this guy saving the Amazon 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 forest, and this girl putting makeup on. She's taking all the space on social media when the interesting guy is in the shadow. Right. They are a cancer. I'm against influencers, and I had to shoot project based on influencer. I was like, holy fuck, you have 50,000 followers or 1 million followers on Instagram. But what kind of talent do you have? What do you have to bring to the world? Why everyone should follow you instead of this person doing amazing stuff for the world? <laughs> so what is your um, understanding of the like cool influencer, the one that you would like to work with? I mean, I don't want to work with influencer. To me, the, the term influencer... No, I mean, like, the, that influencer that you think has talent and... Um, has something to bring to the world. I mean, it's mostly people who are proper artists uh, who don't use their own persona and beauty to get what they want. They have a real talent. And you know what? Actually, some of the influencers go on a tangent and they use their beauty and charisma to get attention and then they do meaningful stuff. They're the best because they turn something really superficial and shallow into something interesting and meaningful. Those who are not the best, I don't have none of them in to my mind right now. I don't really use Instagram so much. I use it to, to show my work and um, and that that's that's about it. I mean, but um, I, this culture of, of self is becoming, it's, it's sickening because people are empty at the end of the day. Right. They cultivate the image so much that they forget to cultivate their inside. You can't spend your time trying to be pretty and read book at the same time and or try to do a reflection of yourself. This is fucked up. <laughs> this is absolutely fucked. And to me, it's making a generation of people who are, um, I that they, they, they lost their kindness a little bit. They become soci- sociopath a little bit. <laughs> and it's self-absorbed. Self-absorbed pieces of shit, you know? And I, I, I've got difficulty with that uh, because there's so much more to it. And, and it's unhealthy. And also, what do they show to the youth? What kind of example are they? I mean, influencers in the 19th century were Freud and Voltaire and fucking Socrates. It was the influencer of the antiquity. And what now? Kim Kardashian? <laughs> Come on. Come on. Give, give Nietzsche and Freud and all those guys some followers. Don't, <laughs> don't go with the others. They, 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 they need to feed the brain. They need to feed the soul and not to feed to feed the pure consumerist instinct. It is bad. But I mean, we need everything to make a world, you know, and, um, and I'm not going to spit on who pay me, but God knows I'm not going to do anything to influencer anymore because I, they, don't, they don't need me anymore. They just need to use their cell phone yeah. and shoot themselves. They, you, don't, they don't need me in any way for that. You also mentioned that what you were doing, it, it physically harmed you. Yeah. So can you tell more about it? What was it like? I mean, you have to imagine that a shooting we start at 5 a.m. or finish at midnight. Right. It can be one week. We don't work anymore. I'm 31. I feel like I'm 50. My body is falling apart. Um, not only commercial job, but um, we shot a, a feature lens movie in the beginning of the pandemic on Sado Island. Sayo, the movie is wonderful. It went to festival. It's my first feature lens movie. But you have to imagine that 
in one week we slept maybe 10 hours i mean this is not healthy um this is my job and especially because i'm not only a director i shoot i write i edit i compose the music of most of my projects i went to conservatory in paris when i was young i i oversee everything and i'm so emotionally attached to my projects that it's killing me and especially when it's a commercial job when i get emotionally attached to this project and then the client is destroying everything and makes the piece something meaningless mm -hmm. that is only at the end of the day to make his own boss happy and not to make the viewer happy. I'm like, holy fuck, I, I've got no reason of like, existing anymore. Right. Why, what do I live for? Um, so yeah, it is something that is psychologically and physically draining, um, especially when people, you're like me, uh, trying so hard to earn money doing a personal project that goes against trend and we're coming from uh, the right place, you know, from my heart. Um, so it is physically really challenging. Uh, not mentioning that I don't have the healthiest life. I travel a lot. I do also to relax, party hard. Uh, I'm currently hangover. <laughs> uh, party hard <laughs> yesterday. I do. Um, it doesn't stop me to be sharp or anything, right. but I yeah. do not take care of my body. I've been single for years and the single life also is somehow not that healthy. Um, do you have any regrets? Oh, no. I've done everything I wanted. Everything, like literally, I wanted to move to Shanghai, I moved to Shanghai, I want to move to New York, I moved to Shang New York, I wanted to make a movie, I made a movie, I made a second movie, a third movie, a fourth movie. I've, I've done everything I wanted, I've got no regrets. But in the next five years, I'm gonna to have to make a choice. If I want to build a family, uh, I do believe as an artist, I need to calm the fuck down, I need to sit, relax, and reflect on my life. Right now, it has been so fast. The last 10 years, I've been, I've been moving in the blink of an eye, and I think to evolve as an artist, to be, become a better director, a better human being, I need to calm down. I need to, and I will regret not doing that. So every year, for the last three years, I've been trying my best to move to Kamakura, to get a whole Japanese house, uh, why not a girlfriend, and just try to live a little bit slower. And something wonderful might come out of it. Most of my projects have been, to me, um, a blueprint of what I can do, uh, templates of what I can do, uh, drafts. Even my last movie, to me, it's not representing my potential. It, it's going to win some prize at festival. It was selected in Fantasia. It's a great film festival. Cool. But to me, it's a draft of what I can really achieve. But to achieve that, I do believe I need to calm down. So I, I will regret not calming down and trying the slower life soon, sooner than later. So in April, I think I'm going to try that uh, to move to Kamakura. Anyway, Tokyo is going to be held the Olympic if people come. Uh, so I, I, I will I'll regret not doing that. Other than that, no, mm -hmm. no regrets. You you regret not doing things. Right. I've done everything. <laughs> and, you did it your way. No, but that's it's a real. When we, we experiment and ask a bunch of people, what do you regret in life? And they always say the same thing: I regret not having done something. And they never regret having done something. Right. Because you do it. Doing it can lead to regret to me. Not doing it. That's, that's why Nike understood that long time ago and they created the best motto, just do it because it's exactly what it is. Just do it. If not... Yeah, it's I've, my favorite slogan, by the way. I love Nike. Yeah, Nike, Nike, brilliant, brilliant company. Right. Um, even though in the shadow of Nike, there is a little Chinese boy working hard. <laughs> nothing is perfect. Uh, nothing is perfect. Uh, but... Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nike, We're laughing, but it's true. And they're also pushing consumerism. At a point that is ridiculous. What are they doing of all the shoes they don't sell? You think they give it to African kids? I don't think so. Uh, they are pushing consu consumerism. Uh, and I love Nike. My shoes are Nike, but they're really old Nike. Um, but once again, all those companies are meant to disappear. I can't wait for the fin uh, next financial crisis. <laughs> all the capitalist world is going to fall apart. A lot of people are going to die. And maybe we're going to realize that universal income is a solution and that, and that we should calm the fuck down. Right. There is no green transition. There is just calming the fuck down and stop consuming. No electric car is going to change that. Stop driving. That's all there is. That's the long-term vision, of course. I see. So uh, before coming to our podcast, you were, and when I asked you like, what kind of um, story you wanted to tell, you, hmm. you said that you really wanted to inspire the people who are into filmmaking yeah. like, to, to still like, uh, buckle up and make it. Hell yeah. Right. So, yeah, I mean, 
I recently opened a production company named DMBZ. Yeah. Uh, that's a her sign is a sign I find really cute uh, with two hands like that. And I realized recently that that was a sign under 18 years old porn shop sign at the entrance. <laughs> I, I didn't know that, uh, but that's a sign. Uh, it's called DMBZ um, for uh, Dame Boys. Dame means forbidden in Japanese. Oh. And Dame Boys mean that basically uh, there is no way of doing filmmaking. People are going to tell you, dame, it's forbidden. You can do that. You can shoot and break the 180 degree rules or some bullshit like that. No, there's no dame. There's no rules applying to filmmaking. You, to me, I mean, my next movie, I'm going to shoot it with iPhone 12. And God knows Apple also. I know Apple is also pushing consumers to next level. But my last iPhone was iPhone 6S. I bought it five years ago. So I do believe that five years is a good day. I love Apple products for that. It's, it has a longevity. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, I believe that you don't need to go to film school. You don't need to ruin yourself uh, buying expensive gear. You should just buy, take an iPhone and shoot, edit, shoot, edit, watch old movies. Watching movies is essential and just make movies. That's why um, we have a partnership with Canon and we're going to, uh, we're going to the workshop about how to teach, uh, teaching young Japanese kid had to make movie with nothing. And more and more are doing so, but some other are stick, uh, sticking to the regular traditional plan of filmmaking, which is clearly not working. When you see Japanese cinema right now, it's dying out. Mm -hmm. Korean movies are incredible. Korean cinema is opening Asia to the world. Right. Mission accomplished. Japanese cinema is the same. I've been the same for the last 20 years. Thanks God, animation, animated movie are freaking incredible. And there's so much creativity in Japan. But the cinema industry needs to change, evolve. And I believe uh, young content creators should just go out there and shoot, shoot, shoot. I mean, and if they can stop shooting themselves a little bit, that would be nice too. Because nowadays, you have a frame that is vertical. Half of it is a guy speaking. You don't see the background. I don't care. You go to this, those places. Show me the places. Show me the people. I also want people to stop focusing on themselves and focusing on where they are, people they meet, and create a story around it. Um, different uh, kind of filmmaking than vlogging. Vlogging is to me also cancerous. I mean, I'm watching all those vlogs and I'm like, why, what, what, what are you talking about? Why can I see other things than than that? You know, I think it's, it's vlogging. I'm against that. Also, it's not really creative in terms of editing and stuff. I believe there's so much to do. So we want to inspire people that they can make it in this industry. They can earn money. You can earn money doing meaningful content. Um, you can pr promote yourself using social media, you can inspire others, and at the end, you, you, you can brand yourself. That's something people, they can find online tutorial about how to use cameras and stuff, but not how to brand yourself. I managed to find job all around the world because I've been sending mails to everyone. I branded myself like crazy. Um, and that's something you don't learn at school either. So we're, we're trying to influence people and to, to inspire young, especially young Japanese filmmakers, because Maybe they're scared, or maybe they think it's hard. And I mean, it's hard. It is super hard. You're gonna get sick. You, if you want to earn your artist statue, you're gonna have to die for your for your craft. If not, you're not gonna be an artist. You're gonna be maybe a creator, maybe a creative, not an artist. So, if you want to go to that path, you know that you're gonna have to sacrifice uh, things. That's also something people need to know. And it's not because you have a 50,000 likes on the picture on Instagram that you are an artist. And that uh, you, there is so much depth we can give to that. And now with fast consumerism, we're losing that. So I want also to enlighten people about how to give depth to their project and right. make it unique and meaningful and not a clone of another thing, you know? That's yeah. essential. Um, right. that, but that's my vision. Uh, DMBZ, we are composed of five filmmakers. One is from Siberia and Canada. One uh, is from France. Uh, I'm from uh, I'm French Canadian. One is Belgium. He's a producer. One is Chinese. Uh, Alan Liu is a cameraman, DP. He shot my last movie. He's incredible, ta incredibly, incredibly talented. We want also to make videos each of us yeah. about our style of filmmaking. I'm like that. I'm art before anything. Your vision before anything. But my friend Artem, he loves fashion video. He loves that. Yeah. He loves and he's amazing at it. So why not teaching that? I don't agree with what it, what uh, his mentality. Sometimes I don't care. He's so talented. And it can inspire people. There is no one way. Everything I say is just my vision. Is that true or not true? I mean, that the world's going to fall apart. Yes, it is true. But I believe that there are so many kind of filmmakers and some guy just love beauty. 
just think that this girl is beautiful and I'm going to make a movie about her and her clothes are going to shine and that's a craft, that's crafting and he's really good at it. Um, Alan is just good at making movies. We all have different skills so I wish that my company and uh, my production company not only make amazing projects but we also educate uh, the youth and influence the youth to make better and greater projects uh, in different ways and some people might hate not myself. Not follow the patterns. Yeah, exactly. But people might hate my style and I want them to love Artem style or Alan style. We're all different. Right. So mm -hmm. that's why we created this company. We just are friends making movies and it happens that we're good at it and it happens that together we even better. So why not opening this production company together? The DMBZ. That's... Uh, I'm happy about that. So what is the ultimate dream for your company, the Tune Vision? Because you spoke a lot about your dream and how how many uh, things you have to you have to go through like to achieve it. I mean, I did a big mistake in my life. I thought for 10 years that I could do it alone. And it made me waste so much time. Um, so my dream changed. I've got my own dream. We're different from the company dream. Right now, we want to end up Having a whole program online, the DMBZ Academy, where you go through amazing uh, seminar and uh, work workshop. Uh, we want to be more than just a filmmaking company. We really want to create a whole generation of dummy boys at the end of the day, of you know, kids with their high iPhone doing incredible stuff and changing the world. That's a that's a dream of the company to be to influence in the great to the greater of good. My personal dream. As, as an artist, is when I watch a Miyazaki movie, um, Ghibli movie, there's yeah, something, the in, is, there's a feeling yeah. that that's awake in my heart. Right. I, I become a child again. That's so true. It's so hard to imitate what they do. I mean, like, when you watch these movies, it's like, you, even though you, you, you can consume a lot of media, you constantly somehow go back to their, these movies. Because the, the feeling that they um, make you feel, it's like, it's unrepeatable. And it doesn't get old. This is universal. Yeah. So this me has like a feeling. I want to give it to people watching my movies. I want my movie to be timeless. So that's why my last movie is about the Shinto, death in Shintoism and this abandoned island of Sado Island and the, and the Buddhism paradise. It's a super deep movie, but in 10 years, it will still look good because it doesn't, take any, it doesn't follow any trend or anything. And this going back to childhood, childhood feeling that Miyazaki movie has, have and just Ghibli movies, and that heals me. When I feel really depressed, I watch them and I'm like, holy fuck, I, I feel better. I'm healed. I want people to have this feeling when they watch my movie. Miyazaki therapy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ghibli therapy. And and, and God knows uh, Ghibli, don't go to 3D. We've seen what you guys are planning to do. No, Ab aboard. no that'll, be, oh, that'll be so bad. Aboard or let Disney buy you. I, I hope... I mean, if Disney by Pixar, uh, Disney by Ghibli, because they've tried to buy Ghibli, Ghibli for years. When Miyazaki is going to die, he will, I hope never, but he will at one point, they will buy it. And maybe he's going to open to proper CGI Ghibli movies. And why not? Yeah. I'm all for it. I love Pixar movies. But yeah, I, I want to, to be able to, to create this feeling with real actors. That's why I came to Japan. My, my ulcers also happen because I've been working on this big movie for five years, way too ambitious. That is on a small island with yokai and super beautiful CGI. I had people who work on a Fantastic Beast, sorry for the movie, mm -hmm. signed on it. I had such a crazy cast and stuff and we had that to do it, but the Japanese cinema system cut us short and they were like, we're not, they told us that they couldn't sell it in enough theater in Japan, so they didn't want to give the money. When See, there is Netflix, there is Amazon. You don't need to sell it in theater. This is Japanese old school mentality, but I'm still fighting for it. And my movie Sayo is in the same vein, but with 100 times less money. Mm -hmm. 100 times. Like, literally, I need 100 times more money to make this movie. And that's my work. Uh, that's why I'm still in Japan and I'm not giving up. But it's, that, crazy. it's a battle of 15 years. It's going to be a five to ten years uh, battle to make this movie, but I'm going to make, I would have made ten, ten movies, ten, ten other oh. movies in between. So it's not, I'm not wasting my time. At, but I'm young still, I'm 31, and I do believe I've done quite a bit for my age, and the white hair show uh, <laughs> how hard I worked. I've worked. But I mean, yeah, I want to make those movies and, and to, to open this yoka world, this Japanese deep, deep spirited world to the world and, and to give it a new edge and a new. Um, 
when you're breathing, you know, Miyazaki movie, Ghibli movie are old. What is what is there right right now? They, people compare um, this director, anime director, who does uh, uh, my name. Remember my name? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mokoto Shinkai. And he's amazing. And he talks a little bit about Shintoism. He talks about tradition. He's incredible. But and yet, I don't feel the same. The same watching his movies. And but he is wonderful. So but and it's animated. It's not with real actors. I do believe that maybe my dream is impossible to realize because animation helps so much very killing those feelings. But I watched, for example, the movie um, of Kitano-san. I'm so bad with name. Summer of Kichijiro. It's a movie with a kid. It's with the same composer of the music of Miyazaki. Mm -hmm. as, uh, I forgot his name too. <laughs> I don't know any name. I've got Alzheimer, I think. Uh, um, basically, he, this is a movie gave me the same feeling. The Goonies, Moonrise Kingdom. Wes Anderson. Those movies, they have the childish spirit. Movie from the 80s, I'm watching over and over again. They had this spirit. My kids play on Fortnite and, and uh, they have different. Yeah, I like how you said, talk about the spirit, because I think that's the right word when you describe um, the movies. The spirit, it, it, it is. The spirit, and the atmosphere. It, yeah, it is. It is so special. And Japan is like that in real life. I've been to Yakushima. I've been to some forests in Kyushu. I've been everywhere in Japan. I probably travel more in Japan than most Japanese people because of my work and because actually I'm more curious about Shintoism than most Japanese people where Japanese people go to the temple. They don't know, you know they, they just do it. It's almost in their blood to do it. They do it without really understanding why they do it. And only us, Gaijin, are going to try to dig deeper because we are so curious. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean... I see spirit and I feel spirit everywhere in Japan. Maybe not in Odaiba, but uh, <laughs> in other places where there's trees, river, and mountain, that, which is basically the three main gods. I mean, I feel uh, the spirit of Japan. I've, I've seen them, I've heard them, I know they're around, and sometimes you feel a breeze of wind, wind, and you're like, holy fuck, I'm not alone in this forest. They are still here, they haven't left. Because Japanese haven't changed too much. If they change too much, they will live. But I feel that because Japan kept, kept it so real for years and years, and they haven't left. The gods are still around, the kami right. and the yokai, they are still around. They might live sometimes, but if you go deep, deep enough... So in you also forest, believe, like in Japanese philosophy, that everything is still alive, like even the rocks. Why the, not? This yeah. is such a good spirit. That's funny that such a materialistic society right now mm -hmm. has such a pure uh, concept of life. Mm -hmm. This tree is a god. Hell yeah, it's 3,000 years old. This river, it's a god. Yes, it provides water, which is essential to every life. This mountain is a god. Yes, they are gods. Way more, way better god than the Christian god or the <laughs> Jewish god or the, or the Muslim god. What? They are, they, are, they are god that makes us alive. They are not a, a, a beautiful vision of ourselves. Those, those, I, I do believe those religions, the, the main monotheist religion, are sending a wrong message that there is a better version of ourselves up there, a, a sublimized version of ourselves. This is bullshit. We are what we are. And we need and, and and our environment is the only way for us to survive. Right now, we are fucking it up. And Christianity is not innocent to that. Yeah. We never learn to love it. We only learn to love humanity first. We are the best. We are unique. We are the center of the universe. That's completely absurd. And 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 I think it has to change. This Buddhist spirit and this, this, this Shinto spirit is way better in the, this day and age. Protect the tree, protect the forest, protect the river. And, and I'm so surprised to see Japanese people um, going in a shallow direction of overconsumption because there's so much consumption here. And thanks God they are saving their forests and stuff. But that's because they spend money destroying forests from Indonesia and from other places to get their wood and stuff. That's what's going on right now. So... I, I believe Japan could, in the future, become go back to the greenery and go back to what it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be an overly technological technology. I believe Japanese are supposed to be closer from nature, and I think they are so unhappy in big cities. Yeah. I think they are guess. so sad. And I think COVID taught us that's a worldwide thing, that we are not supposed to live in big cities. Big cities are falling apart. New York is a satellite of itself right Isolation now. Isolation is so bad. Yeah. yeah. You go back to the greenery. Go back to nature. Go. It's time to to move on. And uh, 
I want to share this message also in my movies. That's the thing. Stop consuming. Start, start living. We are not living in cities. We're just surviving. We're pathetic. And uh, people need to realize that. And that's not where true happiness uh, is. And that's what I really realize in Japan also. When, when I'm outside of Tokyo, I'm so happy. That's why I'm going to try to move to Kamakura. Even though it's not so far, it's still good middle range. Okay. Let's see about that. So if you were like for the last like to give the advice for the um filmmaker who are just starting and who have nothing but mm. iPhone, what would be your, your biggest advice? Be curious. Um, everyone around you is interesting. Uh, everyone has a huge potential. Be curious. Stop focusing on your face, on how you look, uh, on your fucking clothes, on your nails. Focus on the old grandmother Obasan in a train next to you. She might have so many stories that 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 will change the life of others and that needs to be captured. Uh, be curious about each and everything in life um, because there's so much to it. Um, and just, just maybe cut the internet for a day or two, you know, just live it's in the present moment. I, I don't have a SIM card for two years. So no number. On <laughs> my card, there is no number. I mean... How do clients contact you through... They don't. They send me mail and they contact me when I want them to contact me. That's, that's I'm not, cool. I'm so you, you set your own rules. That's nice. Hell yeah. I'm not going to be the slave. We are the slave of our cell phone. We look at it all the time. We Okay, it's a really useful tool, but it's got so perverted. Um, just be here right now and look up. Look around at and you'll see that... The yeah, there is so much out, out there. I've been, I've been so curious about human people. That, that's why I hope people can feel that in my documentaries and in my movies. I am so curious. I'm with them. I'm not with my cell phone. I unplug my phone when I shoot. And I've got a strict rule. You come in on my set. No you, phone. No phone. That's Hell a good no. Rule. That's a good rule. Yeah. People might call me Mussolini. Might say I'm a dictator. <laughs> yes, I'm a dictator. I'm a piece of shit. But you're not going to have your cell phone on your thing. And if you look at your cell phone... The only I like how you chose Mussolini over Hitler. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, yeah, I'm not gonna go because and I love the, I love I love the word Why Mussolini. Not Putin? <laughs> Mussolini was such a piece of shit too, but at least like he was he, he got shit done, you know. I know <laughs> awful human being. Um, but the only person who should have a cell phone is a producer. He's our daddy. He makes sure we don't lose them ourselves. Shout out to David, my producer, the only person in Tokyo who can handle me, as I'm really hard to work with. Um, so only the producer should have a cell phone. Everyone else should never touch their cell phone, especially for fiction movie. People need to be so invested in the yeah. present moment. Don't look at your phone. Yes, you, you need to just like dissolve in your character. Oh yeah, forget it, forget it. Uh, no, actor and actress for sure. No choice. After, of course, if you're a makeup artist and God knows you have two hours doing nothing, I'm not gonna ask you to not use your cell phone. But mm -hmm. there is something so special about enjoying the present moment we are losing. And what the only way for me to catch that back is to shoot movies. I'm here, right now, right here. I'm not, um, I'm not in, a, in this virtual world, in a web. Uh, <laughs> looking for what? For who? Who gives a fuck? <laughs> it is absurd. From, from, uh, if we put on paper our behavior in our day, we read, we, if you, you read that, you're so like, bad. Oh, this is pathetic. It's really pathetic. Uh, it's yeah. really pathetic. And, and we are Confront, confronted by so many challenges coming. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? That, that's why my next movie and is going to be literally a guy in Chiang Mai. In, Chiang Mai, uh, in March, uh, Chiang Mai becomes the most polluted city in the world because they burn all the forest and all the trees in the mountain around the city. So you have so much fog and it's so dusty. And I'm going to create in this movie a world that's going to look like it's really the end of the world. And the main guy is going to be on his cell phone the whole movie. He's going to be shot with his cell phone. He's going to make yeah. selfies and stuff. And he's going to document the end of the world. And that's what we're going to do. We are so good at documenting that, but not doing anything about it. Uh, and our, I hope I'm going to sell this movie to be able to make the other one because it, it's starting to be tough. I've, I've, I've quit the commercial job for seven months. I am so poor. <laughs> so we need to go back to making a little bit of money doing uh, interesting stuff. But uh, hopefully I will sell this one. That's the goal for the 40s, 30s, is to make... But the goal for 20 was make movies and be good at it. Go to the 30s, make movies, and get paid to make movies and documentaries. That's a, that's a nice goal. After that, I can have a couple of babies, a wifey, and, you know, do other things. Write, maybe. Surf. Cook. 
take care of my garden, meditate. You know. Sounds like a great plan. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I have to plan at one point. You know, mm -hmm. it has been a little bit crazy for the past years. But I, oh, another advice for for kids starting: have a fucking plan. My plan was to make a feature movie at 25. Every single year, I have that plan, and I make it happen. If not, I get crazy and I get depressed. Plan is, is planning is everything. Long term plan. Next 10 years, what are going to do? At 34, I'm going to get my first kid. It might be a boy, it might be a girl. I can't plan that. <laughs> but I don't really care the sex, but between 34 and 35, it will happen. It has to. That's where I want to be. At least in this day and age. Um, it, it, I think planning is brilliant because your plan is going to be fucked yeah. anyway. You can, it's going to be destroyed by but life. But at least you have direction. But you have the direction. Yeah. You're 20 right now. 25, you're going to make a feature movie. The feature movie you always dreamed of doing. I failed. I was six, five years, five years late. Still and you made it. Oh, yeah, I made it at 31. Or at 30, I made it. But God knows I was disappointed. I thought I would be like Xavier Dolan. I knew I had the potential. I fucked up. I was, I, I did my bad decision. I met the bad, bad people. I met good people too, but I didn't treat them well. I've been an asshole. I've been a good guy. I fucked up and I also did good. But I lost five years. And not lost, but you know, I could, could have done movie uh, uh, earlier in life. So, at least I had a plan. But I see some people, they are just... Yeah, I know it's hard to be young now, COVID, and the future is a bit dark, but, I mean, let's make the best out of it, you know? Right. Uh, exactly. I have no choice. There's no other way around, eh? Right. Thank you, Jeremy, so much for uh, sharing your incredible story, for saying everything the way it is. It was really fun to talk to you and got to, to know your spirit, mm. your ideas. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Please click link below to see Jeremy's works. We're gonna <laughs> put them right there. <laughs> below. Yeah, below. Uh, th there's no way to put it up, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, below. So, yeah, it, it kind of sounds bad, right? Below. Especially in my case, because but uh, <laughs> it's it sounds better when you say it. And uh, yeah, follow us, DMBZ. We're gonna do workshop. Uh, Dame boys, we're gonna do workshop. Uh, we're gonna do a lot of making of our project. We have a whole plan for the next month to make our filmmaking more public and to inspire people. Yeah. So check us out. Uh, talk to your family, your friends, your parents about Get it. Get off your phone. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> right just, after this podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Share what we're doing, then drop the phone at least one, uh, one day a week. That's my prescription. <laughs> uh, no fun day on Sunday. Sunday fun day. Sunday no fun day. So that's my advice for you guys. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeremy, and uh, watch us next week. As always, we're gonna bring new passionate people with their stories. Let us know in the comment um, about this episode or whatever you 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 want to talk about. So we'll be happy to hear your feedback. Thank you so much, and see you next week as always. Yeah. Bye bye. Oh, 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 oh,